I'm Carl, my name's up here second, and you'll see Simon up here in about 10 minutes. He's gonna give uh, an example, but we're advised by Wenmei who we do accelerator stuff by and large uh, these days. We're part of the paid program, so we've been working with some science teams who use Blue Waters to accelerate some of their GPU code. Um, but really, uh, you, you know, when we're working with these, a lot of application science teams, the kinds of questions that maybe aren't explicitly asked but are often on their minds are, you know, can I even speed up my code using GPUs? I've heard of GPUs, I've heard they're fast. Or there are science teams that have taken steps in using GPUs on Blue Waters or elsewhere. Um, but they may think their implementation is fast. Uh, they may not know whether their implementation is fast. I've heard that comment from people here over the past few days as well. Um, but I guess what Simon and I believe uh, is that these questions do actually have answers and you actually can answer them yourself without our help, although we're happy to help you. Uh, so what I'm really gonna do is give a really quick overview of two GPU performance profiling tools that are on Blue Waters. Um, and really the form that's gonna take is I'm gonna show you one screenshot and then some of the slides are gonna have some performance information on them and that performance information will be taken from the tool but you won't be seeing it in context. The tools are easy to run so you can check it out yourself if you're kinda curious. Um, and a lot of GPU performance struggles come from GPU memory hierarchy and you may be aware of CPU memory hierarchies, caches and stuff. Uh, GPU is similar in some way, different in other ways, uh, and so I just wanted to give a brief highlight of that. And then Simon's gonna talk about an actual application that's running on Blue Waters that we've worked with, where some, there was some optimization done and it actually ended up causing a little bit of a performance loss and how he corrected that just to show that there's, you know, there's some nuance to some of this. Um, so just to get started, the first tool is uh, NVProf. It's the NVIDIA, sort of the basic NVIDIA profiler. Um, you can use this on the command line to sort of get uh, like function runtimes and stacks and things like that, but really the way that we like to use it is you invoke it twice, one to collect a timeline of CUDA functions, kernels, and uh, runtime calls, so runtime calls being memory allocations, device toast transfers, that kind of thing. Uh, and that has very little execution overhead. And then there's another one that collects detailed performance metrics of your code, so you have to run your code twice, uh, you run it the second time, it takes a lot longer than the actual, uh, you know, un, um, yeah, the, the normal execution time. And, uh, but you get, so you can generate these two files. Um, and then this also can be done with MPI. There's just one caveat, which took, took me a little back and forth with the Blue Waters team to work out. Both of these, one, uh, it seems like the MPI runtime will sometimes fork a process. So if you don't tell it not to do that, the NVIDIA profiler won't be able to find any CUDA kernels that were executed. And the other thing is that if you're using multiple ranks, you might want a different profile output from each rank. If they all try to write to the same file, uh, the visual, the viewer won't be able to understand what's going on. So this is just a little caveat. Um, I think this Alps app PE thing is actually not in the Blue Water stock documentation. So, um, I don't know, just something to keep in mind, I guess. Yeah, but is, you can it, do this. It is now. We it is it. now? Okay, great. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, you can use this with MPI. Uh, and so this is, this is the main visual profiler window. So after you've run NVProf, you open it up and import those two files, and you get uh, a bunch of kind of really dense information. This is a timeline. You can see some runtime calls up here. This is just a specific application that I've been working on. Uh, this is GPU utilization, this is some kernels. You can see that some of these kernels are overlapped in execution, so that shows up. This is a little bit small to see, but this is the profiler saying which of the kernels it thinks are the ones you should target when you're optimizing. Uh, and then you can click deeper into this and spend, you know, I could be up here for like an hour talking about just this tool, which I'm not gonna do. Um, but there's a lot of information here, and that's from this tools where all the information is just basically taken verbatim. Uh, so just to motivate this sort of memory bandwidth problem, this is what a lot of people run into. Uh, so the K20X is what has, or what Blue Waters has, and it has a single uh, precision floating point rate of almost four teraflops. Uh, but it only has global memory bandwidth of 250 gigabytes per second. So if you just kind of do a rough back of the envelope calculation, uh, to fully utilize both of these, you would need to do 63 flops per word that you move from memory, and that's very difficult to achieve uh, for a lot of applications. So many applications end up being memory bandwidth bound. And I've just thrown up 
Uh, this is older. These are newer architectures. And you can see uh, the original point that I would be making is that this number hasn't gone up really as fast as this one. Um, but with Pascal, they've changed memory technologies significantly, so this is actually getting a little bit better. But uh, anyway, that's just kind of for reference if we're thinking about what future systems might use if using NVIDIA chips. Uh, and so this is the memory model that's kind of explicitly presented to you when you use CUDA. Uh, you have a thread and you know you have variables on the stack and so on. Uh, there's something called shared memory. Uh, and this is memory that's kind of small. You can put data in it that's locally accessed by threads in a thread block. Uh, and it's very fast and low latency. And then you have this big global memory space. And there's something called constant memory, too, uh, which is read-only. Um, and so constant memory is for high bandwidth access to read-only data. So maybe if you have a particular stencil or some constants that are known at runtime and not compile time, you kind of load them up and get really good access to that. Uh, and so, for example, in Blue Waters, we get six gigabytes of global memory and 48 kilobytes of shared memory, uh, roughly speaking. Uh, but really what's going on under the hood, and this is part of the reason that people get hung up uh, getting performance out of the GPUs, is that uh, on the left is kind of an abstract representation, and on the right is sort of what's actually going on in the hardware. Um, so really, instead of the thread memory, you have these registers, and then there's shared memory, but the global memory is actually backed up by an L1 cache, an L2 cache, the actual DRAM. Uh, there's something called a read-only cache. There's something called a constant cache. Uh, and some of these things are per SM. So a GPU is organized into multiple parallel processors, and each of these will have the so many of the so-called CUDA cores that you may have heard about. But each of these will also have this shared memory, and L1 actually turns out they're combined on the chip. Uh, so there's this read-only cache here. There's constant caches, and NVIDIA doesn't really tell us how big these are, what their bandwidth is, they just tell us that they're small and high bandwidth. So we don't know too much about those. Um, and then there's some kind of shared bandwidth to L2, and then there's this relatively thin pipe out to the DRAM. And I guess I just wanna point out that it seems weird that this number's smaller than this number, but let's remember that there's 14 of these uh, sort of in parallel, so this aggregate number is like two and a half terabytes per second or something. So if you can somehow utilize this memory hierarchy in your application, that's what's gonna give you the performance improvement. If you, it, it doesn't, almost doesn't really matter too much what computation you're doing, just because there's so much compute available. You have to have this memory hierarchy in the back of your mind. And this seems like a lot, but each of these things has a specific purpose. Uh, so the L1 cache, basically, you don't get, just like on a CPU, you don't really get to use this. Uh, this is for register spills and stack variables. And uh, so your global accesses will go through here, but right if there's 48 kilobytes of this and you have a few thousand threads, you just don't have many bytes of L1 per thread, so it doesn't really do much for you. Um, but this, there's an L2 cache, so if you have a bunch of thread blocks, the L2 cache will capture data locality across those thread blocks. So any data that's shared between thread blocks will live in that L2 cache. Uh, the read-only cache is for uh, un sort of random reads to random addresses, and it's actually got this feature kind of carried over from graphics processing, where it'll do 2D prefetch for you. Um, the constant cache is for, quote, very small amounts of aligned uniform accesses to read-only data. So if all of your threads are accessing a constant at the same time as they execute in lockstep fashion, that's really what this constant cache is used for. Shared memory is if you know something about all the data that your threads are accessing at the same time. Uh, if there's repeated accesses within a thread block to some particular set of data and you can predict what indices it will be at and the access pattern, throw that into shared memory. And DRAM is, of course, where everything else has to be. And the only way you're ever gonna get anywhere near that 250 gigabytes per second is if you access consecutive entries in your DRAM with consecutive threads with accesses that are not too big. So it's actually kind of hard to get this in practice uh, to use this effectively. So really, you're relying on this. Um, but if you think about your application, or you talk to your grad students who work on your application, um, <laughs> if your memory, if you have memory accesses, most of your memory accesses fit in one of these four things, you can expect, maybe with some effort, to get good GPU speed. Uh, and so I just wanted to show a little bit of data. This is a, a basically an introductory CUDA course type example that I whipped up in the cafe in the lodge in like 30 minutes two days ago to show you some stuff. So what I wanna show is that if you do use this, you can get some pretty decent speed up without a huge amount of effort, and it's important to do so. Uh, so on the right-hand side is sort of an initial version of a stencil. So right in a stencil, we have each element 
uh, you multiply it, you know, there's multiplies and accumulates of all of its neighboring elements and a kernel. And so if I have a chunk of these input elements, I can load a halo of all the necessary input elements that are used to compute that into shared memory and map that to a block. And I can put this, the stencil kernel in constant memory that's shared by every single thread. And so if I don't do that, you can see that this memory throttle basically refers to the fact that there's too many load instructions to the global memory being issued. Uh, and so the GPU is basically saying to the threads that are executing, you have to stop because I can't accept any more DRAM requests. And so this is basically an indication that we're limited by the DRAM bandwidth, uh, but we're limited because we're making too many requests, not because we're using all of it. Uh, and so once we do this transformation, we use the shared memory, we use the constant memory, we start getting things like, oh, I can't execute because there's already an addition executing, uh, which is the kind of thing that we might like to see more. Um, or, you know, this, this one basically says that there's a bunch of threads ready to access, but there aren't enough computation resources, so it just arbitrarily picks a thread. It doesn't have a good reason. Um, so this data is something that uh, the visual profiler will give you. Uh, and so just to sort of highlight this, uh, on the right-hand side, again, is this simple one. Uh, and you can see that once we do the optimization use shared memory, we're using more than a terabyte per second. We're getting more than a terabyte per second out of the shared memory cache or uh, sorry, the shared memory. And uh, this speed up of one to 7.8 is not too far off this improvement that we get from uh, the device memory reads and writes. So with, with a little bit of effort, even in a simple example, uh, you can get a huge amount of application speed up by respecting the memory hierarchy, kind of regardless of the computation that you're doing. Um, and this is sort of a final piece of information that I'll give you. Uh, so this is, Utilization, so on the right-hand side, again, simple, and this optimized one, we have compute and we have memory. So this is kind of the most basic information that the profiler would give you. And really, in a good application that's well-optimized, you would expect compute to be up around 75, 80% of the theoretical GPU compute. That would be great. And you can see, even in my example, even though I get a huge speed up, I'm not even using most of the GPU's compute ability. If you look closely here, you can see that this kind of indicates that the load store instruction unit is what's limiting. It just can't issue more loads and stores. And over here now, the part of the memory system we're using most is the L1. But you can see we're getting 1.2 terabytes per second, and we're still only using about 50% of it. Um, and so NVVP will actually tell you, it says kernel performance is bound by instruction and memory latency on the right-hand side. Um, and so actually what Simon's gonna talk about is how to deal with applications that are sort of bound in this way. As you do optimizations, many of them become less simply memory bound and more bound by the latency of the instructions that you're doing. And as you know, we've heard Wen may say and several other people who work on accelerators, uh, you need to have, you need to hide this latency to get good performance. So. I'm gonna go ahead and let Simon take over for me. But I'm also happy to field any questions about some of this initial stuff. I know it was pretty high level, but I wanna impress upon you the importance of the memory hierarchy in the GPU. It's kind of sophisticated, but each part has a purpose. If you map your application to those parts, uh, things will work out well for you. So we have time for some questions. Any questions? No. Okay, why don't we? Continue on, and maybe someone will yeah. come um, up with a good question. Perfect. Um, can you guys hear me? Is this? All right. Um, so I'll continue on. And like Carl mentioned, um, uh, we work with real applications that run on Blue Waters through the pay program. And what I'm going to be showing you are actually uh, uh, things uh, that we run. And all the charts that you see are actual numbers from a specific application that I'll go into more detail later. Um, but there, what I'm here to talk about is what, what to do when you deal with these latency-limited kernels and how to identify, it, identify them in the first place and what to do them and what to do about them. And the first thing that you will see is that when you have a very low compute and low memory uh, utilization of the system, it's kind of like a hint. You're like below 50%. You're actually closest to the 40% line. Um, that's pretty bad. You're saying that you're only using about 40% of, uh, of the capability of the GPU, which is not good. Um, so unlike CPU cores, which are latency uh, 
uh, they can handle latency in a much different way. GPUs hide latency by basically launching threads that are ready to go to hide the latency of other threads. So the trick is to have as many threads that are ready to go at any point and as many of them uh, on deck. And when you have low utilization, it means that you have way less of them. So what you're seeing here is that you have 40% of the threats that you have should have on deck ready to go at any one point. So it's hard for the GPU to hide any latency at that point. And this is very common when you have very highly optimized kernels that actually follow uh, what Carol mentioned about the cache hierarchy, using shared memory, and all of these things, because this is what we teach when teaching GPU programming, is take, to, to take advantage of this hierarchy. But when you optimize without thinking about um, these resources, you can go too far and actually lose performance. Um, so what are the actually resources that limit this occupancy of the GPU? And here I, I mentioned, I made a table very similar to what Carl has where I label Blue Waters that has a K, uh, K20X. Um, we have Fermi, Maxwell, and Pascal. And up here you have actually the, the resources that limit how much you can actually execute at any one time. And reality is basically how many threads per SM you can execute, how many blocks, per, uh, how many, uh, number of blocks you can have in NSM, uh, the amount of shared memory per SM, and finally, number of registers per thread. And overall, you see a, a, an increase of this. And if you kind of divide this table in two, uh, the reality is that you have more control on the amount of shared memory you're using and slightly control on the number of registers. And that will dictate the percentage of threads per SM and blocks per SM that you're going to end up using. Um, so it's, it's something to be careful about. A lot of code was built and programmed for Fermi. Um, and if you see here, there is like a double from number of threads per SM and a double the number of blocks per SM. But if you notice, the shared memory per SM didn't increase. So what this meant was that you can have no, double number of uh, threads for executing, but they better have half the number of shared memory usually say, uh, they better be using half of the shared memory they were previously using to actually have them executing. Um, but if you were register limited, you actually got more leeway. And then next generation, um, they actually double number of blocks and they double, number of, and they double the number of, of, of shared memory per SM, but the ratio didn't change. So you will get no leeway if you want to use the entire, uh, uh, as much of the, uh, of the utilization as possible. So it's important to keep in mind the ratio. And then Pascal actually went down. Um, I have no idea why. Uh, it's kind of too new to know. And I expect this to change with better generations of Pascal. Um, so once you know that you are latency limited, what do you do? And this is the case study where all these numbers are actually from a full complex application. Um, and the thing is that uh, NDVP, because of MBProf, actually is very helpful because it will actually tell you what to do and what not to do and what to look for. And these lines that I have up here are almost taken uh, straight from NDVP. It told me that my shared memory was uh, at almost six kilobyte per block. K20 is configured to have 48 kilobytes per block. So I am maxed out at eight blocks or 32 warps out of the possible 16 at a one, any one time, because every thread uses too much shared memory, so there are so many blocks that get, get scheduled to the SMX. So what do we do? Um, well, you just go to your code, look at all the uh, variables labeled shared, you comment them off and make them private. I know it sounds counterintuitive because we have been telling you to do the opposite for a long time. Um, and then many of you will gonna say, well, my application is more complex than just that. I'm doing some kind of reduction or an aggregation at the end. I can't just go ahead and make everything private because they need to communicate in some way and I'm using shared memory to communicate and reduce. Um, and then here I'm here to tell you that you don't have to use shared memory for reduction and communication. There are actually instructions that are made that are actually happening in hardware which are called the shuffle instructions. And this is something that I do not see enough in code. Actually, I almost never see it in code. And these shuffle instructions, what they're doing is basically, uh, in hardware, they are uh, reducing um, and communicating the results of different private variables in each thread into one. So no longer you need to have shared memory to have these kinds of reductions within a block. You can just call these shuffle instructions. They're very powerful, and they're as fast as shared memory, in many cases, faster. <clears throat> 
So I will recommend all the, anyone who is in charge of their codes, of their GPU codes, to go back to your code, look, and if you can use shuffle instructions, use them. And the other nice thing about this is that in many cases when you remove shared memory usage, you can get away with removing many of the synchronization points. Because to use shared memory, you have to basically uh, load everything into shared memory, synchronize, compute, synchronize, then reduce. Uh, with shuffle instructions, not really. You can get away with the first two synchronizations, and you only have to synchronize right before the shuffle. Um, so you can get away with getting rid of two synchronization points altogether. Um, and the figure you have up here is basically MVVB telling you that as you decrease the number of shared memory per thread, you can execute more warps. So it's very, very obvious what to do. So what happens when we actually I did apply these techniques into the code I was working with, and um, what we see is that we, we notice there's less demand on the shared memory as we expected, um, but compute actually didn't increase much, uh, barely a few percentage. So um, we're still latency limited. We, can, we didn't quite escape what we wanted. So if you remember the table I showed before, the other resource that could actually be limiting you is the re register usage. So we actually rerun uh, MVProf and MVVP and he told me the next following story. Um, that actually, whoa. Yeah, so I'm using about 56, uh, 56 racers per thread, uh, which is about 14,000 and some racers per block. I can only handle 65,000 per block, per SM, sorry. So it actually lowers me back to now four blocks um, instead of the possible 16 that I could actually be using, have on deck at any one time. Um, the bad thing is that I cannot directly control registers. Um, this is something that the compiler will de determine for you, and he's playing this really difficult trick of trying to reduce the number of registers because he knows it's a limited resource, but he wants to have variables alive and ready to go because he knows that uh, uh, access to, to global memory is low. Um, but you can actually help the compiler around by actually using this, um, uh, that's unfortunate, it's kind of blocked down here, but if you use this qualifier right before the kernel, it's called the launch, launch bounds uh, qualifier, and it takes two parameters. In reality, the first parameter you have to um, state, the second one is optional. I actually, for this specific example, this code that I worked on, I left that as one, so you don't have to worry too much about that one. But what this uh, ver uh, argument says is telling the compiler that um, be ready to handle these many threats and be able to use the entire SM, uh, uh, SMX with this parameter. So what the compiler is gonna do is gonna try to figure out the number of registers that it will have to use to be able to use the full SM using this max thread per block. So how you increase this is that I'm currently using 256 threads per block. I'm gonna kind of lie to the compiler and say, I'm gonna use double of that or triple of that to a certain degree, and then that will ex force the compiler to use less and less racers um, as it can. Um, something to remember, though, is that as you lower the number of racers, you might be increasing the local memory access, and you might be increasing the number of instructions because you're losing live variables, uh, so you have to compensate through other means. Um, so after I apply this in this case, um, we went from 56 racer to 24, and finally we're able to increase uh, uh, computer utilization to up to 70%, which is this is exactly what we want to see. Uh, this is the end goal, or, or when you finally run your um, uh, profiler again at the last time, this is what you expect to see whoop, at the end. Um, but this is not an easy game to play. I could have kept reducing racers to basically one, and what would happen is something that Carl mentioned, is I'm gonna have racers spilling. Um, all these axes are gonna go back to some L1, and it's gonna create conflict that eventually could go all the way to global memory, and it will just ruin your performance uh, at the end. So um, the real question here is what does it all mean in terms of speed up? Because at the end of the, of the day, if I, it's not that you don't wanna have good utilization, you wanna have good speed. So I was working with two kernels from Changa. It's an end-body cosmological application developed by Professor Tom Quinn, University of Washington. And I was working with the two main, uh, has two GPU kernels that take the most of the time. One is the particle gravity computation and the other one is no gravity computation. 
And both kernels are non-trivial. They're fairly complex, have plenty of reductions in them, as many synchronization points. Um, so what ends up happening is that they, both of these kernels had the same problem. They were both latency bound. They were using a fraction of the utilization they could have you been using. Um, so when we apply all of these techniques, uh, we went from 40 to 70%, which gave us an extra 1.66 X speed up. And the other one, which is the most time consuming one, we went from 30% utilization, which is not very good, to up to 60%, and it gave us another 2X speed up. So if you wrote a piece of code, a piece of a CUDA code, and you got 7X like Carl got, you might be missing on another 2X on top of the data that you lost because you over-optimized without thinking on the resources. So if you value that extra 2X, it's important to optimize your code thinking about what, how much shared memory I have, should I, um, and keep that in mind, uh, number of registers and so on and so forth. So what are the takeaways, uh, takeaways out of this presentation? It's basically writing CUDA kernels is becoming easier. Um, NVIDIA is trying to make this as easier as possible. But getting good performance is not, is not as easy as writing CUDA kernels. Um, make sure that you know the tools you have available to you, um, knowing, what, uh, knowing what is lacking and where performance can be improved is, is key. Um, fit your applications well on the GPU memory hierarchy because that's going to be your initial, the initial place where you're going to get good performance. But resources are not limited. Optimizations without thinking about the resources may actually hurt you at the end. And I'm going to leave it with the quotes, two quotes from uh, Lord Kelvin that can say this better than I could ever say it. It's to measure, is to know. And if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. So use your profiling tools. Um, and finally, I touch, we touch upon a lot of topics, and we cannot go into a lot of detail. So we left a lot of links here for you when these slides becomes available uh, for you or for your grad students to look into them. So all of the things we touch, shuffle instruction, latest and limited kernels, lunch bounds, all of this is available for you to look more into. And finally, um, I just want to briefly mention the teaching kit is for all the, uh, the people who has GPU courses. Um, this is freely available for people teaching these courses through NVIDIA and it has a lot of examples and touches many of the things we, me and Carl talked to about um, today. Um, so with that, thank you so much for staying for our presentation and I can take, me and Carl can take any questions you have. All right, we got some time for some questions. All right, sure, we'll wait in the back. Oh, I didn't go for my jog this morning, so. <laughs> so uh, it seems relatively straightforward to, uh, well, relatively straightforward to, to try to optimize d very deterministic methods. But I work on Monte Carlo methods, which are very random. And what happens uh, depends on a random number, number generator. So it's not easy to uh, intuit what the memory layout and how memory accesses will behave. Have you had experience trying to deal with, with random problems like that? Yeah, so I mean, those are definitely the kinds of problems that are very challenging to use GPUs for effectively. Um, I can speak from some of my specific application experience where access patterns are, I mean, uh, somewhat irregular. And I mean, this isn't even touching on problems like uh, graph traversals and stuff. We're just another huge sort of area. We could have done like a 30-minute presentation on techniques for optimizing that. But uh, in my experience, what ends up happening is you might be able to do some kind of tricky techniques, like doing some kind of sorting of your data to get a sen some sense of what the locality is going to be. Um, but you end up, uh, and sometimes you can rely on things like if you know some data is read only, but it's, uh, but it's kind of random and you can't predict what it is, like things like the texture cache will work out well for you as long as the data isn't too big per SM, or like the, you know, the, the working set. But uh, those, those things are very challenging to do. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, what you kind of end up having to do is trying it out, looking at the profiler, and seeing if the GPU is doing what you think it's doing. And if, if it is doing what you think it's doing and you're not getting the performance that you want, then you, know, you might be out of luck. Um, and the one thing I could add to that is basically, um, I would suggest texture memory um, is when you have an array of structs instead of, um, 
and you have the access pattern is not very nicely. Uh, texture memory has a slight benefit in that kind of accessing pattern. It's not random, but it's not a nice access patterns, and you want to use texture memory for that, that kind of pattern that you can't quite fix. Okay, thank you. All right. Any other questions? Just out of curiosity, uh, how many people here have a code that's using uh, CUDA or OpenACC? So over 30, 40%, that's pretty good. All right, great. Well, if you don't have it, I hope we haven't put you off of doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, we're happy to help. So if you have questions and if you want to work with us through the paid program, feel free to contact any of us and we can start the process.